everyone. Um, happy Thanksgiving week. We're so excited to have you with us, whether you are here inside or outside in the parking lot or perhaps worshiping with us online. Um, I have a couple of things to say before we invite Mark Cochran up to give the announcements. Um, first of all, a pop-up children's choir. If you know the song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Come over here today at 5 o'clock. We will get it ready for Hanging of the Greens. It's so simple. One rehearsal, one performance. We need more kids. So please come at 5 o'clock today for that. Um, the second thing is, if you have had the green paper and signed up for Hanging of the Greens, make sure those all get turned into Terry or delivered to me because... Here comes Hang of the Greens next Sunday, and I want to make sure I've got all the people who wanted to read and all the people who wanted to decorate um, on my list for that so we can all get ready. I'm so excited. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mark for the announcements. Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to see everybody in service this morning, uh, both in the sanctuary and outside. Is there anyone outside today? Honk your horn if you, if you can hear me. Fantastic. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, like I say, we're so uh, glad to see everyone. You're very welcome uh, to be here. Uh, if there are any visitors, uh, we do have blue cards in the pews. Uh, we would ask that you just give us your name uh, and maybe some contact information that we can reach back out to you. Um, if you're not a visitor and you have a prayer request or a praise that you would like to share uh, with the staff, please fill this out and drop it in the, um, uh, in the offering plate. Uh, I know that Frank and staff uh, do pray over uh, these uh, weekly. So uh, bear with me this morning. We do have a few announcements. Uh, 
Christmas poinsettias. Uh, you can order those. Uh, if you can turn those in today, that would be fantastic. Uh, the cost is $10, and they are available in red or white. Uh, as Shelley mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, they are looking for more children uh, to sing in the Christmas cantata, uh, and rehearsal uh, is today at 5 uh, p.m. Hanging of the Greens is next Sunday, uh, November 28th at 5 p.m., with some refreshments following. Uh, again, Shelly indicated that if you would like to participate by reading or decorating, uh, just let her know. Also, if you would like to provide a finger food dish, such as candy, cookies, brownies, uh, peanuts, or other uh, items, please bring that to the church kitchen tomorrow, or tomorrow, next Sunday morning, November 28th. No cakes or pies, uh, please, they ask. And if you have any uh, questions about that, you can let Beth Johnson know, uh, and she can give you more information. Uh, there is a called uh, church conference uh, on Sunday, December 5th, following worship. Uh, there is an agenda out in the vestibule and at the other church entrances, so pick one of those up and plan to participate uh, in that conference. Uh, also, uh, you may have received an email from Frank or Terry regarding a uh, congregational survey. Uh, this survey is important for if, if you choose to provide some feedback or input uh, regarding uh, future ministry opportunities here at the church. Uh, Team Unique uh, is sponsoring this survey. And if possible, if you haven't already completed it, please complete it uh, by today or tomorrow. You can do it online, or you can fill out uh, the paper survey. This survey is available in the vestibule and at the other church entrances uh, as well. Are there any announcements that I have overlooked? Fantastic. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we gather this morning uh, to worship you, help us remember as we enter this uh, week of the Thanksgiving holiday that all things that we are thankful for come from your, you and your hand. We ask, Lord, that you bless this service this morning so that we can grow in our spiritual maturity uh, in hearing uh, God's word and as we participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. Father, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
not esteem him. Surely our griefs he has himself borne, and our sorrows he carries. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone straight, each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. This is what we commemorate through the Lord's Supper, that he died for our sins. Chapter 11, he has quite an explanation of the Lord's Supper as we pass on. He says in 1 Corinthians, he writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and 24, The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray and then partake. Father, thank you wow, for your love for us. That you love the world so much that you sent your son, Jesus, the Messiah, to die for us. That whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We commemorate his suffering and death through these elements at this time. His body was broken for us. And we partake of it now. In Jesus' name. If you would carefully remove the top if you haven't already. This is his body broken for you. Trying to be a little slow waiting for Josh to join us here. If you will carefully pull back the lid, the cover of your juice. Now that we are again passing the plates, we will go back to more normal. Josh, do you have one? Go back to our normal elements in January. So Paul continues in his letter. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this cup, the shedding of your son's blood that is represented in this small bit of juice. Or may we not take it lightly, but rejoice in the fact that you shed your son's blood for the forgiveness of our sins. For without the shedding of blood, as Hebrew says, there is no forgiveness. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Frank, for leading us in communion this morning. Let us stand and worship in response. We gather together.
shine upon you, be gracious to you, Lord, turn his face toward you. Mark Cochran is going to come read our scripture for this week and then say an offertory prayer. I guess the weight of the Bible is too much for the stand. <laughs> If you want to uh, share the Lord's Word with us this morning, uh, we're reading from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verses 9 through 20, and from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by the night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? 
Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. And from Isaiah 43, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again, as we come to you this week with thanksgiving in our hearts, and we understand that all things come from you, as we return a portion of our blessings back to you, Lord, we ask that you would bless them for the glory of your world so that we can share your word to others and bring others to Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is for Geraldine. <laughs> Seeking the lost 
just once he died to redeem bringing the weary to find rest in him oh jesus lord and savior i give myself to thee for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me i own no other master my heart shall be thy throne my life i give henceforth to live O Christ for thee Not a problem. So we fished all day long and, and, and we didn't have to do much as kids. Then when I became a parent, I didn't get to fish much. You know, you, you, 
you want your kids to learn the, the joy of fishing, so you do everything you can to make it easy for them so they pull in the fish and they don't have to, to work so hard. But you kind of lose the joy of fishing when you're cutting bait. And that raises the question, are you fishing or cutting bait? It's very true here in the church as well. Are you really fishing or are you just sitting on the sidelines? As the picture showed, are you dead wood or are you new growth? Or at least going to help with the new growth. I want to ask you that very seriously because this church will only grow if the congregation does its part. In Nehemiah, we find a very interesting passage about Nehemiah rebuilding the wall. Now, we don't get into the specifics today of building the wall, but um, we, we looked at some interesting passages about Nehemiah as he prepared for the work. My friend John Rogers was here last week. I'm so grateful for him that he came and, and he preached such a good passage. I was planning on using this week as, a, as an in-between between 1 Corinthians and Advent. And uh, when he went to, to Nehemiah chapter 1, I thought, well, Nehemiah is a great book to cast a vision. And it's time we rethought about vision. That's what we're, we're working hard on. It, it, but no matter how hard we throw the proverbial spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks, if God's not in it, it doesn't matter what we come up with. Amen. We are seeking diligently to do our part while we're praying for God to show us his part. That's why we need your help with the surveys. As Mark mentioned, there are surveys in the back, surveys at the tables out this way, surveys on your computer if you have one. Please fill those out if you haven't already and help us. We are studying our community as the team unique. We are studying our congregation and we are praying diligently, Lord, where are you sending in the midst of where those overlap? We can't reach all the needs here. Uh, and we don't have the resources to reach all the needs. But where they overlap, Lord, where are you sending us? It's kind of what Nehemiah did when he went to Jerusalem. Dr. Rogers gave background of this uh, book. But let me, let me just summarize it again. Uh, king Saul became king in about 1050 B.C. David was around 1,000, Solomon about 950, and for another few hundred years their offspring lived as kings. Some were good, God blessed, some were not so good, God punished and judged, judged them and punished them. Finally, by the year 587, God had had enough. He'd already uh, allowed the outsiders, the Assyrians, to conquer Israel and take them, the northern kingdom, and take them into captivity. And now he is allowing Jerusalem to be conquered finally. It was interesting. I was in Isaiah this morning, and, and just a generation before Jerusalem was destroyed, Hezekiah was the king, and he was, Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrian army of hundreds of thousands, evidently, and they were mocking God and saying, who can save you? And, and Hezekiah told his people, be quiet. And he went to the temple and he prayed. And that night, 180,000 Assyrians died. But Hezekiah was a good king. He sought God, not so his offspring. There were some bad kings that followed. And so the, de temp the uh, temple was destroyed. The walls were destroyed in 587 and they lay idle for 70 years before some of the exiles were able to go back. So about, round figures, about 515 B.C. I know you love all these numbers, but stay with, stay with me. About 515 B.C., 70 years after the, the conquest, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, some of the exiles went back. But sadly, they didn't do much. I preached on Haggai a year ago. If you remember that very short little book, um, Haggai was there, he was a prophet, and he was saying, why are you having problems with your work? 
Nothing you do seems to benefit you. You have taken care of your nice cedar-walled houses and left the temple of God in ruins. So Haggai was able to get them to rebuild, help rebuild Haggai, Zechariah, and others to rebuild the temple, but they hadn't rebuilt the, um, the walls yet. That was up to Ezra and ne then Nehemiah. It happened all pretty close to the same time. So the first wave went back in 515. Ezra led the second wave in about 458. And here's Nehemiah hearing that the city is still in ruins in 445. That's been 140 years. These exiles have seen the destruction of their homeland. Of course, these don't remember that. Only the stories. And they've gone back and they've done nothing to restore Jerusalem and the temple. So Ezra and Nehemiah go back, and of course these prophets, and they rebuild. But how does it happen? We read in this passage, um, if you remember vaguely, Nehemiah from last week, Nehemiah heard um, terrible news that they still hadn't done anything to rebuild the city. And he weeps and prays and goes before the king. And the king says, what's the matter? You're never like this. He says, well, my city's still in, destruct, in, in ruins. And uh, he asks to go and re be able to restore it. So he goes and restores it. And we, we read about that. And, and then one night in chapter 2, verse 11, after he'd been there a few days, he decided to get up in the middle of the night. And he and just a small company who were with him rode around the, temp the, the, uh, not the, temp rode around the city walls. And he tells you where he goes and he even tells you there's so much rubble in one place that he couldn't even get around it quite right on his donkey. And so he, he had to get down and, and, and was very careful to get around that part. And he, he, he saw what the situation was and he devised a plan. Let's go on to verse 17. Because that's where the crux of what I want to say is. In verse 17 it says, Then I said to them, He'd already done his work. He'd done his homework. I said to them, that's the leaders, you see the trouble we're in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also the words that the king had spoken. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. There's some very simple things that have happened here that parallel we, where we are. Ezra, Nehemiah was here. And he, he took time to go around the, the city walls. And he saw the situation and the condition. Well, I don't need to tell you what's happened in the church and how God has begun to bless us once again. But the situation and the condition of this church, followed by 18 months of pandemic and all kinds of restrictions, has, has been a challenge to overcome. Not quite as bad as having to rebuild the ruins of a burned city. But nonetheless, the situation and the conditions could have been quite dire. I remember coming in, in June and we were talking with the stewardship committee as they were trying to figure out. Do we even have money to keep going on? Do we have people? Because we didn't know who was going to be here in, in, in May before you started having uh, services outside about Memorial Day la uh, 18 months ago. So the situation and the condition was, was very uh, different and difficult. Nehemiah was able to come in quickly and, and catch a vision of what God had in mind. It's taken us a little longer. We're trying to, to see what the spiritual walls, so to speak, of this um, that are needed to be rebuilt here. But the transition team has done some work to provide a mission statement. Love God, grow disciples, and serve others that you approved just a few weeks ago at our last meeting, uh, church conference. Transition, the team unique, excuse me, is trying to, to work from that and build up based on uh, demographic studies and congregational studies and, and then um, 
the, the prayer to build an understanding of, of what God is wanting to come here and we will determine more clearly what that mission statement's going to look like. That's the vision. We're working on that together. Oh, I, I could have come in and said, here's what we need to do. But that would have been from an outsider with no basis for support in the congregation. And it may not have been right because I didn't know the situation and condition. But now having been here 18 months and with the leadership of, of the key groups that are meeting on a regular basis like the deacons and the stewardship committee and the personnel um, and the church council, we're starting along with these two new teams, the transition team and Team Unique, to figure out where we are and where we need to go, where God would have us to go. It's very similar to what Nehemiah did. He, he went and he saw the situation and the condition. He cast the vision. He took into account the resources that were available for him. The, um, the hand of the king was on him. He gave him favor. And actually, if you go back and read a little more, he sent a, a caravan of goodies with him. And he told the, the neighboring uh, governors under his uh, kingdom to provide for everything they needed to rebuild the walls and the temple. And so why wouldn't the leaders agree, as verse 18 said so well? Let's rise and build and they did we are kind of circling the city walls now determining what the vision of God would be we have some resources you are good in your giving but giving is not enough we need you personally inviting people and doing work that's why I wanted us to read on to the third chapter. If you have your Bibles open with me, with you, the third chapter of Nehemiah is an interesting one. I've actually preached on that and, and had the, uh, the courage, the, the, maybe the foolishness to read the whole thing for, before I preached. It's a list of people, names, um, groups of people, and it's easy to get tongue-tied reading all those names and different things. But... It, 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 it makes a very clear point. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the chapter today. I'm just going to read one verse. But if you look at it, you'll see, just beginning in, cha in chapter 3, verse 1, the high priests and the priests did this. And then in verse 3, the, the, I mean, excuse me, in verse 2, and next to him, the men of Jericho, and next to them, the sons of Hassaniah. Uh, Has Has I didn't even pronounce that one right. Anyway, and on it goes. But look at verse 5. And next to them, the Tekoites, or the people of Tekoa, repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. That stands out like a beacon of light shining amidst all these wonderful families and groups of people, even perfumers and goldsmiths who are getting their hands dirty to work. They were willing to work hard. Even the daughters, as someone mentioned in Sunday school class this morning, even the daughters of some of the families were willing to work. But these nobles were refused to stoop to serve the Lord. The Tekoites, or the people of Tekoa, actually repaired two sections of the wall, as did a few others. Verse 27 show that, that the Tekoites repaired another section of the wall. But their nobles refused. What about you? Are you willing to help us rebuild the wall? Are you willing to help us rebuild this church? It doesn't happen by coming here on Sunday morning. That's part of it. It doesn't happen only by coming here on Sunday morning. How's that? Or giving your money or going to Sunday school. It happens by being the church in the world. We must love our neighbors. Or as I preached last spring, we must bless our neighbors. Last week, John Rogers did a wonderful thing for me. 
He urged you to fill in the names of, the, of, of your fa- friends and family, uh, neighbors and coworkers. Did you get those sheets, those of you who are here? You don't need a sheet, just take, a, take your bulletin. Who are you praying for that does not know Jesus? Or even, who has gotten out of the habit of going to worship? Sorry, need to step close. Who has gotten out of the habit of going to worship because um, the church had its troubles and the pandemic came and, and maybe other things have happened in their life and they just kind of like enjoying Sunday morning? Invite them. It takes you in each of your neighborhoods around us to reach this community for Christ. We have uh, from the transition team, not sorry, Team Unique, I'll get it right. We have determined that our primary, not only, but primary focus is this section. I-40, 42, Rock Service Station, you follow me? Old Stage, Vandora Springs, Timber Road, I-40. Now, Timber doesn't go exactly to I-40 that way, but you get my point. 36,000 people and growing fast. That's our community. According to the best statistics that North Carolina Baptists can find, two-thirds of those people are lost. I would dare say it's more like 80% Don't go to church, which includes that two-thirds. And if you go down to evangelical, (laughs) it's probably closer to 10% that actually believe in the Lord Jesus. We have quite a mission field here. And we kind of match the mission field. Just as initial demographics were 70 to 75% white in this area, 70 to 75% blue collar, I don't remember the exact numbers. 70, 75% are married, on the list goes. Our income, median income is above the median income for all of Wake County. And it's 50% more than the median income of the state of North Carolina. We have over 40, or right at 40% who have college degrees or graduate degrees. I think it's pretty close to 70 to 75% who have some college or technical school after high school. We're an educated, fairly well off group of folks. Sound familiar? Look around. It shouldn't be that hard for us to rebuild this church. We are like the people around us. All we have to do is bless our neighbors. Remember what that stands for? What does the B stand for? Begin in prayer. As John Rogers urged you last week, please write down at least one person that doesn't know Jesus that you're praying for on a daily basis. I bet it won't take long to come up with half a dozen or maybe 10 or 12. I have a long list just of my immediate neighbors, not even the whole neighborhood. And some family members. We need to begin in prayer by praying for these folks. You ever hope to meet them and have the courage to share Jesus with them, you better start praying for them now. What's the L stand for? Listen. What do you have to do to listen? You have to spend some time with them. Now, you can do it a little bit here and there while you're walking your dog on the street. Or we have somebody, I think it's in our neighborhood, that walks their cat. 
been a while since I've seen them. Maybe they were embarrassed to keep doing it. I don't know. But you have time when you go out and walk in your, in your neighborhood, even if you, you just talk to your immediate neighbors to listen. Just pause. Ask a question. Listen. But it's a whole lot easier if we do the E. What's that? Eat. Eat. We're Baptists. We like to eat. Right? Thank you. If we hope to rebuild Highland or build it anew, and that's the focus I want us to think about, is the future, a new Highland. Not ignoring the past, but looking to the future. We will have to spend time with those who are different from us. Whether it's to eat a meal at home, invite them into your home, take a meal to them, serving them, uh, taking them out for a meal, or just going and grabbing some coffee or a dessert somewhere. Do something with them where you can spend some time with them so that you can talk and ask questions and listen. Another way to, to spend time with them is to do the, sa- the first S. What is that? Serve. We are serving our neighbors in many ways around here. We're serving through the community of hope. We're serving by building ramps. One of our hopes by doing these surveys and praying about it is how can we serve people like us who really don't need a whole lot? What can we do to reach them? How can we love on them? Or as one of my friends used to say, how do we love them to Jesus? Can't do it from afar. We have to get to know them and be with them, spend some time with them. And then the last S is we need to be ready to what? Share our story and his story. They cannot refute your story. They may not believe in the Bible. They may not care who Jesus is, but they cannot ignore the fact that you are who you are and you have a different story from them. Share your story. We need to be blessing our neighbors. Transition team has encouraged us as we have worked through uh, the 10 recommendations uh, from Eddie Thompson, Reverend Eddie Thompson. They have developed and you have supported and agreed with the new mission statement to serve others as well as grow disciples and love God. If we're loving God, it's not just sitting here on Sunday morning, it's loving God in our day-to-day life. If we are growing as disciples, it's not just sitting here on Sunday morning in Sunday school or worship. It is growing in your faith by studying the Word of God individually and then serving others as a part of growing as a disciple. But the key that that is going to be our um, cornerstone moving forward is to serve others, serve our community. If we look through the 10 recommendations that Eddie Thompson suggested, it says begin a concerted prayer effort. We are praying some. I encouraged prayer through a a sermon series in the spring. And then by suggesting you begin with prayer in praying for your friends, neighbors, and lost people. Preaching the word, number two. Continue, I try to continue to preach God's word clearly, faithfully, expositionally. Rebuilding trust, it's coming. It's coming. You can't see it, per se, but you can feel it, I believe. Adopt a simple church designed for ministry. It basically means we've got to cut the fluff, the busyness, and stay focused on what's important. Search committee. Well, we worked around that one. Reduce... The membership role from 1,150, we're down to somewhere in the neighborhood of 750, I think. But there's still four, 350, 400 people that haven't been here in years. Maybe don't even live nearby. Hold staff meetings, we're doing that. Have a plan for regaining members. We tried to do that last spring and we're continuing to do that in other ways. We're talking about some options with the deacons and uh, we will be doing that with the transition team and Team Unique as well. 
uh, involve the CEC. We're doing that. She comes every couple of weeks with us to staff meeting. And uh, she wrote in an email to uh, the transition team, I think it was, or was it the deacons, um, that she had not, she'd been doing this for over 20 years. She had not felt this supported in any other situation in which she worked. We are, that's Amy Waring. We are supporting the CEC. We have a growing relationship. We have had a few events this fall and have had several of you come out and help. It's just wonderful to see y'all out there. We had don donuts for dads recently. There was not one single child that didn't have a dad or a mom or a family member come with them for that. It was so cool to see them all spread out on the sidewalk, eating donuts and drinking and talking with one another. And we had several people helping with that. We're helping with the, uh, the library. It's, it's slow going right now, but we're getting there, collecting books, preparing for a place for them to be back in the back hall over there. So that bridge is being rebuilt. And once we finally get all those things working together and we have a vision, then we'll work on our structure, which will include committees. Folks, I've, I've gone off on the stuff we're doing and moved away from Scripture, but it's very, very close to what Nehemiah did here. He looked at the situation and the condition. He cast a vision. He told the resources that we have. We have resources. You're sitting here in this pew or listening online or in the, uh, on the radio. We have the resources. We have the people. <clears throat> you are giving generously. We have the finances. Oh, there's always more we can do. But we have that. The final question is, will you say like these leaders in verse 18, let us rise up and build? Or will you sit there and be still? In the men's Bible study this past week, we were talking about slaying our giants and Moving forward, and John Clark brought up this passage, which I thought fit us here today. In Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. This could be Nehemiah talking to the leaders of Jerusalem who've been living in that city in ruins for years, or who just recently came back and saw it in ruins. This fits so well. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, the Lord says, I am doing a new thing. Now it brings forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I want some of those rivers. I want that way in the wilderness for us as a church. I want to see Highland grow. It won't be the church it was. Five years ago, ten years ago, when you were having 700 in Sunday school and two worship services. But we may end up again with 700 in Sunday school and two worship services. But we won't be the same church we were five, ten, fifteen years ago. We will be the new church that God is building. I am doing a new thing, God is saying. Will you help us? move into God's preferred future for us as God builds a new thing in and through Highland Baptist Church. Not ignoring the past, but building of it, from it, into the future. My big idea today is we can do all the meetings we want. We can have prayer. We can do the research and the development and writing of these documents that the Team Unique will be writing and the mission statement that transition team came together, but it's all worthless without execution. We need you. Don't be like the nobles of the Koites who refused to stoop to serve the Lord. And remember that we are looking forward to God's preferred future for us. We cannot return to what once may have existed, as I just read. It all begins with you doing your part where you live, where you work, where you play, where you shop, where you eat. 
Are you praying for lost people? Are you praying for opportunities to share Jesus? Are you even praying for the opportunity to invite your neighbors and friends to this church? At least do that. If you're unwilling to share the gospel or your story, at least invite them to church. Let God move in their hearts. Will you participate in rebuilding our Jerusalem? Will you help rebuild Highland? Will you be part of the new growth? Or will you be dead wood? Are you going to fish or cut bait? Let's pray. Father in heaven, guide us each and every day to the people that we need to meet. Whether it be a total stranger before that moment or someone we know in a lifetime, help us to love them to Jesus, particularly those who are far from God, to come back to God. Oh God, move among us as we seek to be your people on mission, serving others, growing disciples, and loving you above all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I ask you to stand and sing with us. If you would like to meet with me and pray or just come up and pray, feel free to do so as we sing.
Thank you so much. We have a bright future ahead of us. I am so excited about the future. I wouldn't have agreed it to say if I wasn't excited about the future. We've already come a long ways. A long ways. Those initial weeks back in May of 2020 when we were meeting outside, we have doubled that attendance on average. And we've got a lot more to go. But it's going to take you. Let us bow in a word of prayer as we close. God, make new wine out of me. Use me in ways maybe I've never been used before as I seek to share your love and your grace with those with whom I come in contact today and throughout the days ahead. May you be glorified in it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.